Uh, thank you. And uh, first off, I'd like to apologize uh, to the uh, to Vasily and the local organizing committee for the kerfuffle yesterday. And thank you for accommodating me today and uh, and for a great conference. Um, I was really honored to have Vasily ask me to give a keynote. Uh, the um, the theme was big EO data, and he asked me because of my past experience with dealing with satellite imagery. And so I thought long and hard about what it is that I would be talking about, and I thought that I would tell my own personal journey through open source and geospatial uh, through, and, and a little history of FOS4G uh, as seen from, from my eyes. I, uh, I played with a lot of different titles here. The one that's actually in the program says how open is revolutionizing science, but um, I thought about open data, how it was that open data or software or standards was re revolutionizing science, and then I thought that perhaps it was the free flow exchange of ideas that was revolutionizing science, and then I thought I'd use a regex expression to uh, just signify everything, uh, and instead I realized that it was about the communities. Uh, because software, data, and standards do not create themselves. Um, great ideas come and go, uh, but it's the community that really needs to promote these things in order for them to succeed. So, looking back, my career has been about helping make science easier for scientists. Uh, I have spent a lot of time doing analytics and algorithm development, and I always thought that these things were harder than they needed to be. Always much more time spent on data preparation and pre-processing and all that. And it, and it just seemed like more could be done. And so while that work is interesting, it's this foundation of this underlying stuff that really needs to be done. So I went to school in the early 90s in photographic science, so it was a really interesting time. It was the tail end of film, it was the beginning of consumer digital. Uh, I worked in the darkroom, uh, and then I studied remote sensing and image processing, taught myself software. And then afterwards, I went to work for, uh, for the government, because that's who owned and operated satellites. Uh, academia and government are the ones that were interested in that data. And government um, were consumers of open source software, but they were rarely contributors. And so I did, in fact, use a lot of open source software. And this was an exciting time before 2010. Uh, I was not involved with the community at all. I used a lot of this data. Oh, Osteo was formed in 2006. It was the first phosphor Gs. And of course, there was a lot of uh, important projects that uh, saw the inception and growth during that time that we still use today. In 2011, I pivoted to earth science in a company called Applied Geosolutions, not to be confused with Applied Geographics in Boston or Geosolutions in Italy. Uh, it was a very small company, and I worked on scientific processing pipelines for, for earth science because I knew about the science a bit, and I knew the software, so I was this bridge that could take science code and implement that uh, more efficiently than, than the scientists could. So I used a lot of geospatial open source software, and so it was that I went to Phosphor G in Denver, which uh, was all about vectors and web mapping uh, from my point of view. Again, this is all the way that I have seen it. Uh, I was a remote sensing guy, and I'd go around and talk to people, and they were not really all that interested in remote sensing. They're sure there was a lot of open source software having to, having to deal with that. But the excitement, and perhaps it was just this year, was really all about web mapping and looking at vectors. Uh, and I remember talking to one guy who, he just didn't see the point in even looking at rasters on a map. He, he wanted to turn them into vectors because then he knew what to do with them. He could perform geometric operations on these things. He didn't know how to deal with raster data. So this had a big impact on me, and so I returned to work thinking of open source even more and being really excited, drinking the Kool-Aid, as it were. And I saw that the scientists were spending all this time doing all this extra work and not doing science. They were doing, they, they were doing non-science, and so I was really looking to streamline that process. The fact is that scientists are messy. 
This is a typical work directory of someone, and if you've worked with scientists, or in fact are a scientist, you know what this is. Okay, you'll recognize these as Landsat IDs. You don't know where's the original. You don't know what the final version is. You have no idea what was done to this. And <laughs> they were just poor at data management. Um, and no one but the scientists really knew what was going on. And the fact is, is that the data provenance was a luxury of time because they were concerned about publishing the paper in which case you knew what the final product was. Everything was there, right? The paper was published and how you got there wasn't really important to them. That was just a lot of extra time that they didn't need to spend. So the next four years I worked a lot with open data. Uh, I started getting involved with open source software during this time, I started contributing to GeoNode, and I set about to tackle these problems in data management and pre-processing, and making it easier um, to download open data and process it uh, to, to create analytics-ready data. So I worked on um, uh, implementing atmosphere correction, cloud masking, so that we could generate time series from Landsat data and Sentinel data. So I created a couple libraries, Gippy and Gips, um, to, to, to do that, and it would do large-scale management and processing of remote sensing data for the earth science um, co-workers that I had. And so towards the end of this time period, I went to my next Phosphor G in Portland. And man, things had changed. We saw a lot of things during those three years. Planet launched their first doves in 2013. And they showed what a possible future could be like having daily, fairly high resolution imagery. And we started to see much more lower cost drones, like that was starting to get practical. And so there was a lot of interest now and there was a scientific track now. Like scientists were like starting to, you know, buy into the cult. And also Landsat 8 was launched and this was a really big deal. And now looking back on it, it's like, feels like, you know, Landsat has always been there, right? Because the archive goes back to 1972. But in fact, Landsat 8 was a big deal because Landsat 6 was launched in 1993. And um, the fuel chamber ruptured, the thing tumbled and it failed to achieve orbit. Luckily, Landsat 5 was still operational, but it was nearing its end of life. And luckily, it went on well beyond its end of life um, until Landsat 7 could get launched, but there's no global coverage with Landsat 5. At the time, there was no central archiving system for Landsat data. There was regional ground stations that were responsible for archiving and storing that data. And so for much of Northern Africa, there is no Landsat archive for the 90s and into the 2000s. So in 1999, Landsat 7 was launched and it was great. I mean, it was a big improvement over Landsat 5 in terms of the technology that was on board, because I mean, it had been a long time, right? But the disasters were not over yet, because just three years later, the scanline corrector failed on Landsat 7. And the scanline corrector is a piece of hardware that uh, corrects for the forward movement of the platform of the spacecraft, um, and without it, there's these terrible gaps in the images. There's no gaps in the middle, and as you get closer to the edges, there's these gaps, and they get larger and larger. This made it extremely difficult to use. Any area of interest that you would be interested in, if it wasn't in the center of the scene, there were problems, and you had to worry about gap filling or you know, looking at imagery over time, and, and it was a real challenge. So that's why Landsat 8 was such a big deal. And since that time period, we've seen an explosion of data usage. Uh, Sentinel-2 was first launched not that long after that. And so we've seen a wealth of imagery, and thanks to the open data policies of NASA, uh, people are free to use this data and exploit it. Skylar, said this in 2010, Vasile posted this on the first day, said, 
you know, you're awesome, software's awesome, right? We all know this, you can read it. Um, and I think he was, at the time, primarily talking about OSM data, the vector data, uh, not raster data, um, but this was certainly applicable here. Uh, there were a bunch of open source tools for dealing with raster. Of course, GDAL had been around for a while, right? Um, but the use of these tools also really exploded at this time because now there was a lot of data that you could use these tools for. So even though GDAL had been around, a long established tool, uh, those Python bindings, right, were really awkward. And so Rasterio came about. And now Rasterio, some years on, is extremely popular. Um, so now that we had all this data and everything and some tools, a year later, I went to uh, Phosphor G North America in San Francisco. And I also went to Seoul later that year, but I, I picked this because it was in San Francisco. That's where Planet was. And it was like, it felt like it was like the Planet show. Like everybody was all really excited about raster data and what you could do with it. And I was excited because my background was in remote sensing. Like this was super cool. I was somewhat disappointed at the time to learn that all people really seemed to care about was creating a base map so that they could see their vectors on the base map. <laughs> so they wanted to use these images to create vectors for digitization and tracing to add to OSM, or they wanted some sort of seasonal dependent, like fresh up to date, the latest base map um, on their maps. Uh, and so it was great, I mean, you know, the fact that they were using this data, and there was lots of challenges to using this data because it was big and there was a lot of it, and then creating mosaics for a base map is hard. And so uh, this was also about the time that uh, the cloud started taking off, right? And so the Phosphor G community set to work on improving the consumption of data. Uh, the web mapping services that we had for viewing uh, we weren't really great for science because you, these are scaled to a byte and they're for display uh, and you really want the original unscaled data. And so these cloud native formats were really, really relevant for, for science applications because you could access that original data um, for any region without downloading, although it still took some years before the use of that by scientists really started taking off and I would argue we're, we're actually not there yet. Uh, in 2016, I went to work for a company called Development Seed that does international development um, using satellite imagery uh, and mapping for, for in developing countries to improve the situation in, in, those, in those areas. And now, so now the users were non-scientists completely. And so uh, they wanted insights and information derived from this raster data. And Again, these analytics and these algorithms that we're, we're now, now we're talking about using um, were cool, but it was still harder than it needed to be. So I was really, really interested in making this easier, but now it was like for like the average person who didn't really know anything about it. Not, this wasn't scientists anymore. This was like anybody who just wanted to access, access data. And so... Um, I started working on, on SatUtils. Now, SatUtils actually predated me. There was this thing called LandSatUtil that DevSeed had created before, and it was immensely popular because it allowed you to search for Landsat scenes and download them um, with just a command line tool. And it used this thing called Sat API, which was an API running that had indexed the Landsat and Sentinel scenes on AWS. Uh, it was a public API. Um, and so I started working upon building upon this uh, except one issue that I had, really one of the, the challenges I knew that would need to be fixed was that the Landsat and Sentinel metadata were completely different. We served them up in the same API, uh, but you really had to, you had to treat them differently if you wanted to, to, to search for stuff. Uh, and so I gave a presentation in Bonn that year uh, about sat utils and sort of what a roadmap might be like for these easy to use tools, uh, but I just, I didn't have the time to really solve this problem. The following year after Bonn, there was a Phosphor G in Boston. And now finally people were moving beyond the base map. Like, this was like machine learning. Everybody was talking about machine learning like it was something new. Even though 
scientists had been using machine learning forever, for a long time, since there were machines. And so uh, we had a huge number of data scientists that came on the scene. Like, like th they weren't doing science, the traditional remote sensing science. They were interested in, in this, this data science. Maybe not necessarily a new field, but it, it, it certainly had exploded. And they, they were interested more in how to use this data to solve problems, solve problems in, in agriculture, in communicating about climate change, and in international development, uh, responses to disasters, and also to help inform policy. So we've made a lot of great progress in accessing data at scale and processing that data at scale. But discoverability of such huge caches of data is still a real problem. There's too much data. How do you know what to run your machine learning pipeline on if you don't know how, what, what data is out there? And so I would posit that you are awesome, your software awesome, but your data is useless without metadata. Now we all know that metadata is super important. I mean, there's always been metadata, and, and, and we know that. Um, but if your metadata can't be crawled and indexed, then your data doesn't exist in this new world that we live in. At least it can't be found, and so it might as well not exist. And so later that year, I went to State of the Map, my first State of the Map, and uh, Chris Holmes, who I think a lot of you will be familiar with, started this. He, um, he knew I was working on SAT utils, and he, and he invited me to this first stack sprint that was in Boulder after State of the Map. It wasn't called stack then, uh, but it, the idea was we need to really harmonize this metadata across all these, all these different possible sensors. Um, I had a talk this morning, uh, so you can see the recording of that. I'm, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail uh, about that. So here at Google, you put in an ID, and now you can go to the data, right? And the reason why you can do this is because this catalog of data was crawlable, and it was indexed. And so now you can access it. So I think we've made great progress in open standards for discoverability and consumption at use, or at least they're in progress. This is, these are works in progress. Uh, there are new OGC API standards, which look fantastic, and this stack thing seems pretty promising and has got a lot of interest. Um, but we still have problems. There's a really poor understanding of remote sensing data and that really limits what data scientists and non-remote sensing users can do with it. They're good at using machine learning and showing how you can compute and do things at scale, and deep learning has proven to be like pretty cool even though nobody really knows what the computer's doing. And so the tech community um, you know, ha has done these great things and showing what can be done but the remote sensing, remote sensing is difficult and it's complicated. There are lots of sources of variation. There's atmospheric variations, there's, there's this bi-directional reflectance factor, uh, the sun, the reflection of the sun off buildings, off the atmosphere. Then there's clouds, which could be transparent. Um, and so there's just a real poor understanding of accuracy and uncertainty in this process. And, and it's modeled, and that is, that is very difficult. So these, this isn't just the tech community that doesn't necessarily quite know how to get a handle on this. These are hard science problems as well. And relaying that info from the science community to the tech community is even more difficult. As an example, Landsat 8, there's this data user's handbook. It's got everything you want to know about the data. But I bet that uh, most users of the data haven't actually cracked it open. Because if they had, they would see that the distributed Landsat data is not even in top of the atmosphere reflectance. It's something called top of the atmosphere prime, which means that it hasn't been corrected for the solar elevation angle, which means that you cannot compare scenes 
taken from different places or even in the same place on different days. It's arguable to even take NDVI from top of the atmosphere reflectance, but using top of the atmosphere prime to do it is quite a no-no. And when this data, all this data got put on AWS, we had a lot of people consuming this data that just assumed that this was analysis ready. Except that no one necessarily really knows what analysis ready is. There's no clear definition. So at the beginning of this month, I was at this analysis ready uh, workshop in Menlo Park uh, by, that was spearheaded by um, Ignacio at Planet and it was a big community of, uh, of, of, of software developers, of data providers, uh, Planet, Earthcast, uh, the Landsat folks from Eros, uh, Climate Corporation, really a, a great collection, really highly technical conference. And I think that the answer here is, is standards, but you know, users should not have to process each type of data separately. They shouldn't have to process Landsat data and Sentinel data all in separate ways. Um, but, and they also wanna know how to mix and fuse data from all these different sources. But you can't just do that. We need to rely on the scientific community to determine what is possible and what isn't, what you can do versus what you really shouldn't do. And so this requires more engagement between the scientists and the software developers. And I think that this analysis ready data conference was a good start. Um, maybe we could actually determine what ARD even means because no one agrees on what that is and, and how we can communicate the corrections that have been done and the uh, geometric and radiometric uncertainties in this data so that it can be uh, used in ways that are scientifically consistent. However, scientists also have problems. They have problems of scalability, reproducibility, um, the lawyers get involved and they can't distribute their code. And software quality sometimes is lacking. They write spaghetti code and scripts and the aforementioned problem of the data provenance. Many scientists are still doing things the old way. They download a scene, they process it, they write a paper on it. It's really not a global thing. They're not doing global processing. So uh, as an example, I think it's a cultural thing. As an example, there's open source versus publicly available software, right? Scientists think open source means you just throw your code up where people can see it, but clearly we know that that's not true. So now these ideas are not novel. Many people have stated these things many times. I've heard many talks that state similar things. Uh, but to be bold, I will say that you need to stop building platforms in search of a user community and instead build a user community that will help build a platform, the platform that they want, the one that's gonna solve their problems. And so that's why I'm really excited about Pangeo. Uh, Pangeo is a, a community pr promoting these things. And I'm sure that it's not the only one. And if you're out there and you're doing something similar, please get in touch. We should collaborate. We should know what, uh, what each of us is, is doing. So the Pangeo project is a coordination point between scientists and computing infrastructure and software and has several goals to foster collaboration for ocean, atmosphere, land, and climate scientists to do software development when existing software packages aren't available, uh, and to improve the scalability so that we can work on massive petabyte archives of data in order to really determine what's possible and what isn't. And so there's a set of software that Pangeo has been working on. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is in the, in the cloud on, on Binder. The data is stored in the cloud in a cloud-friendly format. The algorithm is open, and so what you have here is an executable paper. You can link to it, you can open this thing up, nothing's running on your computer, and it can scale up. As we see here. <laughs> 
This is running uh, multiple processes on a water model to calculate the discharge from all the rivers in the US for 2010. And this uses X-Array, Dask, Binder, Open Data. And then at the end, we go down and we have a map showing the results. This was possible because of the open source software, the open standards, the open data, and the fact that the scientists worked in the open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew.